We're discussing the impact of collaboration in one of the largest professional services firms in the world. Our guest is Sanjay Srivastava, who is the Chief Digital Officer at Genpact. And we are live in front of an audience at Logitech. I'm so grateful to Logitech for hosting CXO Talk today. And I want to give a shout out to Logitech's Chief Information Officer, Massimo Rapparini. Massimo defines... Massimo defines the concept of the innovative and transformational CIO. Tell us about Genpact and tell us about your role. We're about 90,000 employees. I run our digital business globally. Uh, we built a business around automation, analytics, AI, and experience, customer experience as a, as, a, as a discipline. And then we use that to actually help large corporations transform their current business operations and help them move from today to the new version of who they want to be tomorrow. How does collaboration therefore fit into your business, into your employees, working with customers? Let's start there. You know, we've worked across large corporations. I've actually personally been a startup CEO and I've built small companies, so very agile, small teams. And you look across the ecosystem of small companies to large companies, I think two or three things stand out really clearly. I think there's this whole notion of a connected ecosystem that comes and drives a collective intelligence. And there's been so much work that's happened around collective intelligence, talking through, you know, it's the old notion of it takes a village to bring up a child, but it's the same idea if you get a product out to market, you get a concept into the into an industry, you drive transformation, it takes a very large uh, body of knowledge to come together. We call that collective intelligence. And there's many angles to this, we can come back and look at that, but that's one. I think the second thing that's really important, you see this more in startups, and I think increasingly now across the uh, span of industries, is this concept of continuous learning and continuous innovation. And that requires a bed of connective tissue or a collaborative framework for that continuous learning, continuous innovation to happen. And of course, the third one, increasingly the best ideas and the highest and the most transformative outcomes come from convergence of domains, of con convergence of principles, right? You almost think about it as the low hanging fruits off the table. And so when you actually converge two different things, machine learning and let's say financial uh, analysis, it's really where you get the best outcomes. And how do you drive this convergence of domains? It becomes really important. And of course, collaboration is, again, the, the underlying fabric. It's the connective tissue that brings these, these three things out. Why do you say that collaboration is the connective tissue that underlies these things? Well, look, increasingly, the world uh, is changing. Um, you know, uh, we are bringing in people from different disciplines and different experience sets in a common um, environment that has self-aggregating teams with distributed leadership. That's the new order of the world, right? So as an example, we as an employer no longer hire for skills. We hire for different things. We hire for critical thinking and we hire for continuous learning. And if you think about that for one second, what we're really saying is that underlying all of this, we're accepting the fact that skills will change. The skills that we need will change over time. And so if you hire for one skill to, today, it's not really going to address your, the skill need for tomorrow. And so our thinking has changed around the talent that we bring in and how we actually then sort of give them the, 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 the components. And really to be able to do all of that, right, to be able to have um, distributed teams or distributed leadership, to have this notion of self-aggregating teams that come together to solve for specific problems, disaggregate, move on, and then re-aggregate in different ways to different solve different problems. You can't even get started on that without a, without a connected issue, without a collaboration platform. And so that's why we're sort of really keen on this idea of how do you actually get people together across geographies, across countries, across time zones, across customer bases, and most importantly, across disciplines to come together in innovative ways. So this type of collaboration actually is central to the, to the kinds of projects that you work on, and it's strategic to you going forward because it's what enables you to do the things you do, the core of your business. Well, we couldn't even get started without it. So it's the, it's the first thing you got to get in place. Um, some of that is culture, some of that is tools and the fabric, the physical logistics of it, and some of that is, is just bringing the right people into the mix. But all three of those components are critical. Uh, we won't get out of bed without it. I'm assuming that you've developed very, that you've studied this, the nature of this kind of collaboration very carefully in order to package the components together in these ways that you're describing. 
the keys for us has been to sort of unpack each of those three areas. So we think about collective intelligence very deeply. Uh, partly, if you think about our position, we're coming into a client, we're helping understand their current scenario, we're helping them redesign and reimagine what the business looks like in the future. And then we're actually stacking up, building, and deploying a set of capabilities, technologies, people, processes, to be able to make that new vision a reality, right? And in, in that environment, the notion of collective intelligence, the pieces of DNA and domain that we bring into play, and the attributes from their clients and our clients' kind of perspectives have to come together in a, in a, in a really seamless manner. And out of that sort of general set of ideas, we need to reimagine, to redesign what the engineered output needs to look like. And so that takes a significant amount of collaboration. And this notion of collective intelligence becomes really important. And we have studied it. And so we have found some of the things that work for us and other things that we watch out for. Uh, but it's an important thing to get right. Your business has changed over time. Uh, when was Genpack founded? We were founded about 20 years ago, so we've been in uh, we've been a business that's been out 20 years, um, and we've transitioned three times already in sort of what we do, um, and we're actually on the verge of a fourth transition. So we started as a business process outsourcing company, and we sort of take the work um, uh, that was job number one for us, uh, perhaps job number 10 or 11 for clients whom we took it, whom we served, and then we do it for them. We do it well. We do it with discipline, with rigor, with quality. And over time, we got that to a science of processing. So we could actually take a look at a, a high-level metric, you know, something a, a large fortune foreign company might report to the Wall Street, and we'd break it down into its end-to-end -end process. And we'd actually then be able to prescriptively change some knobs and some levers and some, uh, uh, some dials to be able to get to where the outcome was. We transitioned from that to being an intelligent operations player, which is to say, instead of doing all of the work manually, we started doing it with digital technologies. Lots of experimentation, lots of trials, lots of mistakes, lots of learnings. And through all of that, we really got it right, and we became a leader in intelligent operations. That was stage two for the company. It took about five years to get there. Now what's happening is we've become a leader in digital transformation, which is to say we come in with the set of technologies we've developed in a curated way of applying that that can be done in a replicated fashion across business problems that span different areas of the enterprise. And we can do this in scale. So we actually just provide digital transformation services to large clients now. But even as we do that today, we're sitting here thinking, what's next for us? And for us, leadership in artificial intelligence becomes a really important cornerstone. And as I said, we're not planning to get there tomorrow morning, but we are working on actually thinking about what the future of work is. And in that future of work, how does artificial intelligence change the game? And in that change game, what is the role of domain? What is the role of data? And what is the role of AI engines? And how do we materialize economic value at the intersection of those three things? And so in some ways, you know, long answer, but the short version of it is we're a company in transition. We're transforming ourselves from a company we were to a company we're going to be, and we're in sort of the, you know, step three of a four-step four way. And so there must have been uh, various cultural changes, and with respect to collaboration, how do you get a, how do you get a workforce as large as yours to shift from having, you know, their work assigned and based on skills to now aggregating teams that come together and go apart and having to learn, how do, you, how do you do that? I think it's super critical to have a goal and a vision for who you're gonna be, not at the CEO level, but at the 89,936th employee level, right? It has to permeate across the organization. And so what you really have to do is not only come with a vision for who you're gonna be and what your value proposition is at the board level, but find meaningful ways of actually getting it across the employee base. I think the second thing for us that's been really important in this journey is getting the backbone in place, right? Um, you know, if you just think about IT systems, you know, a part of a business operates in a highly regulated industry where basically lock, we locked on everything in an IT backbone for security, for uh, appropriate reasons. But now that I'm part of a business where I have employees that are waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and writing off, spinning off a wretched server and writing some code, and they need to know that they're going to get reimbursed the next day when they come to work. And so how do you bring all of this cohesive, uh, how, uh, this sort of different workforce together in a cohesive fashion? And the backbone for collaboration needs to come into play. And that was very, very important for us. And the third lesson for us has been that uh, you have to bring what I call bilinguals. It, in the world that we live today, it's insufficient to be a master of English or a master of French. You have to be able to understand both languages in a way that you can bring cumulative knowledge together. And so for us, it's you know, machine learning folks with supply chain individuals. It's artificial intelligence engineers with finance and accounting discipline. discipline. 
And the more we thought about bilinguality and the ability to bring people with multiple disciplines and understand enough of two, I think the more we found our way to success. So I'd say those three things have been crucial for us in our journey of sort of transforming ourselves. Mm -hmm. okay. What are some of the challenges that arise as you're trying to basically accomplish, do business with these kinds of collaboration goals in mind? I'll tell you where you struggle. You struggle when you're not thinking into it, right? So uh, I'll give you an example. A lot of the work we'll do, we'll take an end-to-end -end process and we'll want to transform it. And the traditional way of doing it would be to take any process, you know, think about a large corporation that is in the business of selling something, they're gonna actually sell it, which means there's a code process, there's an invoice process, there's a purchase order process, there's a billing process, there's an invoice process. You, know, you sort of think about this as a code to cash process. And traditionally, when you try and, when you first attack it, when you say, well, let me just take this entire process and break it into its bits, into its components, and let's just digitize every single component one by one by one. And then the re-aggregated version of those digitized components gives you the end view. And actually, that's wrong. It doesn't work that way. When you think about transforming business process, don't take it component by component and do bits and bytes. You have to think about it end to end as a whole and then approach it very differently. How do you get people who are not used to thinking about it this way to suddenly have this kind of holistic view? That's really hard. It is hard. Diversity counts. So you need to have people with different backgrounds, different predispositions, different experiential curves, and bring them together in a self-aggregating team. That's really important. You have to have a very clear articulation or understanding of what the end goal is, so everyone can play on the same team. And then you need to have this fabric we were talking about earlier so people can communicate and correlate, that they use the same vernacular. Vernacular is really important because you're bringing bilinguals together and you need enough of a commonality that people understand uh, each other. So vernacular, sort of the tools, and diversity are three important attributes to getting it right. So the challenge is that, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming dealing with the challenges, it's an ongoing battle, like with everything. It's an um, ongoing battle, and the battlefront keeps changing because the edge of innovation keeps moving forward. So you feel like you sort of learned this, you got it right, and then the Outside has it just moved, and you guys sort of get there. So it's an always evolving uh, journey. Do you have metrics or KPIs or measures around collaboration at all? I'll give you a really interesting example of something we did some time back. Um, we started looking at email traffic within the company. Um, we uh, we uh, essentially built a permission-based database where we have where we took certain elements of email messages, so the from, the to, the subject line, etc., time and started putting into a big data infrastructure. And then we superimposed a, 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 a data science methodology on top of that to really start seeing what the patterns are in the way people communicate. And, and this is easy to intuit, but, if you, if, but, but, but what we found out is that you start getting these spokes of the wheels, of the networks, if you will, where you know, ideas originate and they, you know, I'll send something to you, you'll forward to someone else, I'll pers personal forward to 100 people. And, and so you can spot you know, the centers of these new ideas and new initiatives and new thinking and in the way the emails actually permeate it through the organization. And when we started correlating that to our internal performance management system, which is still the old world performance management system, you know, sort of once a year you sit down and do this assessment and establish and et cetera, what we found is the correlation between one and the other was very high. In other words, we realized that there's new ways to think about spotting emerging leaders, spotting uh, issues that are going to become concerns well ahead of when, they, when you would otherwise know the traditional methodology. And all of that comes in the back of sort of using a new backbone, a foundation of data, a new backbone of AI and analytics to analyze that, and a new approach to thinking about how you measure performance, how do you spot for trouble. Can you boil it down to specific KPIs relating to collaboration, or do you focus more on the outcomes of that collaboration, whatever you're trying to achieve? We're uh, very fixated on business outcomes, and we think collaboration is one of the ingredients that needs to come together. So in the end, we measure outcome performance. Uh, on a sideline, as a company, we actually measure, audit, and publish the business impact we drive for clients. We've done that for years, and we take pride in how that's progressed. Um, and then we realize that there's a number of components that make that whole. So, so collaboration is the enabler of the business outcomes. It's one of the enablers that make the business outcomes possible. It's part of the process. Yeah. We think of this as the underlying fabric across which sort of this notion of collective intelligence, this notion of 
continuous innovation and this notion of convergence of domains really come together. Mm -hmm. If that connective tissue doesn't exist, then these things, three things don't really come together and they don't operate. But if one it comes together well, then you sort of get the magic of all three. But the, but the measurement is of the business outcome. Correct. It's not, you're not measuring the fabric itself. You're measuring Correct. the, the well, results. Well, I mean, and, and we're not measuring at the level of, we're not scientifically measuring and reporting for every single thing, right? But, you know, it's very obvious when you look at teams that perform really well, that collaboration is actually working well. So you can sense it, you can pulse it, you can feel it. You have the dialogue and discussion with, with, with the team members and what's working, what's not working, it all comes through. We do a pulse survey. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been doing this for the last few years now, and we, uh, so, so we do an NPS on our own employees, uh, a net promoter score ranking, which is to say, you know, would you invite a family member to work for the same company, and, and then we rank it. And then we try and understand why is it that uh, you would or you would not. And through that, we capture a number of aspects in our collaboration and the backbone and the infrastructure that promotes the co uh, uh, collaboration. But that's the level at which we, uh, we've done it. And we found it very helpful. So then the measurement, in, in a way, it's two things. One, you have the indirect measurement that you were just describing. And then the other, I guess you could say, it's one of those things that when it's good, you you see it and you know it. Is that? Uh, when it's not right, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. Right? When it's not right, when there's something wrong, you can feel it very quickly. And the reason you can feel it quickly is because, you know, all large results are broken down into iterative, smaller, small bite wins, right? And so because we're agile, because we iterate quickly, you can realize there's a problem early in the cycle. And then you try and jump in and understand why it is. And if it's collaboration, then you address that. And if it's something else, then you go off and address that as well. But yeah, at the outset, at the two boundaries, you've got it right. Sanjay, you've been talking about digital transformation and you've been talking about innovation. Where does collaboration fit into enabling transformation and innovation? Is it something, something different? Is it just part of the same fabric that you've been describing? I think innovation um, and digital transformation are sort of very similar. Uh, it's the same idea. Um, we find that this notion of connected ecosystems which isn't just to say that it's the people from different disciplines that are connected, but actually the underlying data sets and building a foundation for that data as a platform upon which to work is a super important part of any digital transformation project we do. So that's number one. I mean, the second thing we've learned is this notion of experience, customer experience and journey mapping as a way of defining the true norm. Because too often, when you do digital transformation, you start from the, prep, uh, from the, from the foundation of saying we've got to take cost out, we have to improve this number, we have to take that number there. But actually, the right way to sort of drive the decisions that need to be made on a day-to-day -day basis is to use one true north compass. And for us, we've come to realize that journey mapping and customer experience is that right true north, right? So that allows us to think end-to-end. -end. That allows us to think comprehensive and composite. That allows us to truly reimagine the uh, the end-to-end -end as opposed to automate bits and pieces of that and sort of bring that to life. Why the emphasis on customer experience? Because typically when we talk about customer experience, we're saying, you know, a product. But you don't sell products, you sell services. And so tell us about the customer experience dimension. Ah, uh, that's, uh, that's a great topic because, you know, most of us have grown up thinking about experience in the context of a product. I mean, an iPhone's a great example of it. Uh, we don't build products. We actually transform services. We work with clients to take their supply chain mechanism. We take, that, we take their financial crimes outfit. We take their online consumer banking uh, relationships. We take the way they do processing in the insurance industry. And that's a service. That's an end-to-end -end service. And we, di we digitize that and we transform that. But in all of that, right, to really get to the right end point, you have to be thoughtful about how does the end customer of that journey experience it and reduce the friction in that journey and enhance the value and the experience in that journey? And it's super critical because in the end, you know, the reality is in digital transformation, what you're really trying to go after is a differential value proposition. You're not really just trying to take cost out of the system. You're trying to cost as a system is a, is a, is a given. It's going to come up any if you digitally transform. Especially today. Especially today. Because you put automation in, you get, you, you get a lot of returns on it anyway. So that's a given. That's no longer an ask. The ask now is, how do I drive a better top line? How do I differentiate myself in the minds of my customer? And how do I create a journey or an experience for clients that is sticky and people want to come back to? And on the back of that, 
How am I more competitive? How do I manage my, uh, my regulatory compliance better? How do I manage my drug safety better? And so I think the whole business has shifted to uh, driving better experiences and using that for top line growth and long term directional changes in, 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 in the business. And so it's become a big true north and you know, we work with boards all the time um, now in helping their companies, mostly Fortune 500 companies, sort of transform themselves. And I have to tell you that the two things um, I get asked the most about, uh, one of them is uh, experience and the other one is AI. And two are the biggest questions that come through and that's just because that's where I think the, where the road meets the road now. Sanjay, when we talk about customer experience, most of the time we're thinking about products and product companies, but you're a professional services company. And so, isn't there a song that say, what's love got to do with it? What's experience yeah. <laughs> got to do with it? <laughs> That's a great question, I, I tell you. Um, you're right, most people will think about experience in the context of a product. Um, that's not the case. Experience is really critical in the way you think about a service. Um, I'll give you an example, and by the way, we see this across clients, we see this across boardrooms, um, um, what we find when we talk to boards of Fortune 500 companies, there are two questions that come up most all the time. One is experience, the other one is AI. In your personal life, you probably use some e-commerce site to order a variety of things, and I do uh, a few, and, and what you typically find is most of these e-commerce sites will have this recommendation engine. There's AI on the back of it that's predicting what are you most likely to buy, so when you sort of log on and get onto it, it'll say, here are 10 things that are, you know, we think is a great fit for you. The reality is today the accuracy levels are pretty low, so two of those 10 things you might want to buy, eight of them you probably would never touch. What happens when you change experience to the point that you make that AI m much more predictive and now nine or 10 things I can recommend you're likely to buy? And of course, the first takeaway is you've just logged onto the site, you were gonna buy something else and you see these nine things being recommended out of 10 and they're exactly what you wanted and it's like a time saver for you and it's just a fantastic experience. And that's great, but that's not enough. Because what's happening on the back of that is you now the e-commerce site has the ability to actually change its business model. Because now instead of waiting for Michael to log on on, on on Saturday evening and get this nine out of 10 things right and then be able to order it, how about if I just ship you 10 things? You open your door Monday morning, you step out and the first thing you notice is a box in your doorstep. And you look inside the box, there are 10 things. And guess what, nine of those you would have ordered anyway through the week. You take those nine out and you leave the one that you didn't want and you put it back on the, on, on the doorstep. What happens after that? The company, the e-commerce company, now is in a different business model. They're pre-shipping the things you're most likely to buy, and they're focusing on the reverse logistics of bringing that one thing back, and that accuracy keeps improving. So just in that example, if you think about it, I've changed the experience, I've, bring in, I've brought in a different experience for you, but in so doing, I've actually changed my fundamental business model, and that's why experience is such an important thing to focus on, because it changes the playing field. It gets the company in a, on a journey of transformation well beyond the you know the bits and bytes you could do today. Let's talk about the role of AI. I know you've been chomping at the bit to talk about that. It's a very important part of what you do, but let's weave that into this process now. It is a very important part of what we do. Um, you know, we do work for clients and the future of work is gonna change with artificial intelligence. We think AI is uh, not an advancement in computing, it's a complete paradigm shift. Uh, we're no longer telling computers what if then and programming it to, to do that at speed faster than human and do it autonomously across the world, et cetera. We're actually now, instead of that, We've, we're telling computer, this is the right answer, this is the wrong answer, here's the question, and you figure out how to program yourself. And sort of that very simple change in design philosophy, very profound impact downstream, because it allow, allows us to automate the last mile that most enterprises have not been able to in the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of automation we put in. And as that last mile now gets automated, the work of the future ends up being different. And obviously, we do work, as do most of us, and it's something that uh, it becomes really important to us. As we've sort of double clicked on it, what we found is that to build artificial intelligence systems and to deliver economic value in any situation, certainly in the enterprise, you need to be able to take engines, which are AI engines, and contextualize that. We call it goal orientation machine learning. We use distillation techniques and actually data science. We use contextualization in the way we automate different things. And these words of goal orientation, contextualization, and distillation are all concepts that come of understanding the domain, that understanding the subject that you're trying to automate or to digitize, that understand the handshakes the processes will have on both sides. And so this bit about how do you make AI productive in an enterprise really comes back to understanding the domain, 
being able to use the data in meaningful ways and then leverage large AI platforms that are increasingly commodity platforms available in the industry. And for us and for, for our company, that is just the, 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 the center spot of where we want to head, right? Because we can use the domain expertise that we have and help our clients be able to materialize value from AI systems, which by the way, they're going to get significant benefits on because it automates the last mile. So it's big for us. What's really relevant uh, in the world of AI, tying it back to where we started the conversation on collaboration, is the fact that AI systems, at least in the enterprise today, don't get you 100%. I can get you to an accuracy prediction, prediction accuracy of 80%, 82%, 83% off the bat, but you don't get to 100%, which means you need a, a human in the loop to address the pieces that today AI doesn't address. And then you have to actually learn from those exceptions and be able to tune your AI models to be able to progressively get from 82, 82 to 84 to 86 to 88. So it's really important to understand that AI is actually changing the future of work. But to make AI happen, you have to have collaboration in a way that human in the loops actually involved in the cycle and continually tuning and you know, accommodating things like model drift and data drift and so on and so forth. So we're very passionate about AI. Uh, we find a lot of potential in applying that into client environments. We're cognizant that there is, a, there is a human in the loop component that is critical to getting it right. A core part of this collaboration in relation to AI seems to me from, from what you're saying and also from what I hear from other, other companies is you've got the combination on the one side of the domain expertise, so the, the people who are experts in the business, but then at the same time you need to have domain expertise in data science, in algorithms, in how to apply to develop and apply AI. And so this becomes a driver of a new kind of collaboration that needs to take place. That's exactly right. Um, this notion of bilinguality becomes really important because you need people from different disciplines. And you know, I, you know, I often go into enterprise clients and the first question I get is, you know, can you do a quick assessment and give us a sense for where we are on the AI journey? And as you do that, the, the next question comes up and says, well, how many data scientists do you have or how many AI engineers do you have? And I actually no, almost never ask that question. Because for us, what's most important is how many people do you have that understand enough of AI and understand enough of your domain so they can bring the two things together? And I think that's really critical to get right. You have been working very closely with something called Formula E mm. racing that I don't know if uh, too many people are familiar with it, but it's basically taking formula racing, Formula One racing, which I think a lot of everybody knows, has heard the term, but with electric cars. Right. And that bears directly on that conversation we were just having about domain, business domain expertise with AI, data science, data expertise. Tell us about that. It does. So Formula E, I think, um, just quickly, is the next evolution of formula racing where it's based on electrical engines. And it's a really interesting event, um, not only because it's the future of mobility, but actually the demographics and the people that are participating is a much broader cross-section and much more uh, engaged. But you know what we do with Formula E racing isn't just helping the company we support win the race, and the data science isn't just about finishing first. Actually, the algorithms we're building are gonna end up impacting the future of mobility because they're the same algorithms and AI principles that we use today, that we develop today, that'll be used tomorrow to make electric cars more safe, more safe, to make mobility and transportation more cohesive and more uh, uh, evolutionary. And so there's just a higher purpose goal that, you know, when I find my teams getting engaged in across different projects, when, the, when, the, when, when we get involved in purpose-driven projects, you can see a very different level of engagement. If we are looking at drivers and we're looking at cars and engines and we're looking at the skill of making decisions at high speeds on, 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 uh, on sort of dangerous sort of roads. And then we're looking at data science and artificial intelligence to predict things, to be able to sort of uh, to play out different scenarios and make better decisions. And bringing those two disciplines together has just been a great um, fun exercise. And it's a meaningful indicator of how and what enterprise work we do as well. How do you bring together uh teams, racing teams. And so these, these racing teams, just to make it more concrete, these are, these are race car experts. They run races. You got drivers and you have engineers, right? So tell us briefly about the racing team first. 
just sure. to set the stage. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Just by way of background, this is a different race. So most races you would think about um, uh, a, a, as a race where you have a fixed distance you need to cover and then how fast you get from A to Z. Um, the, this race is a little different because what's happening is um, you're racing for a specific amount of time and then based on how you use your energy, you get a little bit of a boost to it. And really what that translates into is predicting how many laps you will have to drive because you have a fixed amount of energy. Old cars start with exactly the same amount, in amount the ba- of energy. In the battery. In the battery, that's right. It's electric car battery. So you have the same amount of energy and, that, and the decisions you have to make is how do you drive in a way that you can get the maximum maximum distance with the battery amount you have. Now you can go really conservative and you can go slow and so you can go as as long as possible or you can be very aggressive and then your battery dies out. And the decisions you have to make is, look, if you end the race with 20% of your battery remaining, actually you haven't done well because you could have used that battery and gotten further ahead. If you end the race uh, because you ran out of battery and you couldn't get to the end point, well that's a disaster as well. And so this game is about predicting accurately how many laps you have remaining at any point in time. Now the reality is a second or two seconds or 10, or, uh, ten seconds before, anyone can predict how much lap is remaining because you can see it, right? But you, know, you go back 15 laps before the end of the race and being able to predict exactly when that, that you've got 15 laps remaining is really important because you can make real-time decisions on who do you want to accelerate and kind of overtake and when do you want to pull back and all the sorts of things. So now if with that backdrop, think about two teams of people. There's a set of people that are experts in driving, that if you tell them, you know, take the curve sharp and turn here and overtake this person, they'll do that really well. Then you've got a set of people that are sitting there using AI engines to predict what's the competitive driver going to do? What have they done last time and what can we predict about their behavior next time? What happens to the friction in this road because we're racing as we did in Berlin on, on, on an aircraft, uh, uh, basically on a runway um, at, a, at the Tempelhof Airport. So it's basically the, the friction on that road is very different from what you would experience on a normal road, right? Because it's a runway surface for aircrafts. And so how do you take all these permutations, combinations of weather and temperature and friction and road conditions and traffic and, you know, and then use that to project how many laps do you have remaining? So you've got people that really need to get that right and you have people that can use that information and make that decision. And they have to operate seamlessly with trust, with integrity, with communication. It's not dissimilar to what we do with other enterprise projects, except most enterprise, if you think of the life of a company and the work we do, what happens in a year? gets done in 45 minutes in a race. And so we have the ability to sort of run that cycle in 45 minutes, learn from it, come back the next time and run it again in 45 minutes. And, and that view to that 45 minutes is what we would normally do in a large enterprise over a year. So it's a really good way for us to learn and iterate quickly. And some of the biggest things I think we've, we've had to focus on is how do you get two sets of people with different backgrounds, different disciplines, frankly, different demographics, personal dispositions, to come together on a common objective and collaborate in a way that they can trust each other, make quick decisions. And that's just, it's been a really great exercise. And so from a collaboration standpoint, actually, how do you do that? Because I have to imagine that on the GenPack side, which is the data science side, okay, they're nerds, right? I mean, you know, they're data scientists and, and programmers. And on the racing side, they're racing geeks. These are really different profiles. Yeah, they're very different. And I think in that difference is the beauty of what they can do together, right? That's the whole reason why this works. Um, But to answer your question, I think what are some of the things that have to come together as a glue to make it happen, right? So so this ability to um, have trust, and trust doesn't come from implied trust or assumed trust, it comes from this iterative process of trying, experimenting, seeing the results, and then building your confidence around it. And Especially so that, in something like this with a, right. with a race. That's where, exactly right. You know, it's a sort of all or nothing. That's right. That's exactly right. So you have to deliver sustained performance over a period of time that you sort of trust the other half and say, wow, they got it right. I've got to do my bit. And if both of us do our bits, we'll end up together much better. So I think that's one piece that's really, really important. But we've also learned other things, right? So we've learned, um, going back to experience for a minute, experience is a really important part. I mean, for me to come up with a recommendation to do this or that to a race driver at the heat of the moment, at the speed he or she is going at, with all of the forces around them, and get them to absorb that in the instant and act on it, I have to think about the experience. I have to think about how do I actually expose that information to them. So how do you visualize? How do you communicate? These things become really important, right? So iterative, agile, 
uh, small wins to address the trust part, visualization, articulation, communication to address the experience part, and then actually having a common set of goals, which, and it's of course easy in racing because it's obvious, it's black and white, but you know, in most environments, we'll end up in a scenario where we have supply chain planners, and then we have machine learning uh, uh, technicians, and we have to bring the same magic together, and it always comes down to those three, those three things. How do you get experience? How do you get a common shared set of goals that are visible? And then how do you build trust through an iterative, agile, small win, big, big outcome kind of a, approach? Any final thoughts or advice to business people who are listening and saying, yeah, I want to inject greater collaboration or have my organization evolve towards incorporating greater degree of collaboration? Well, look, I would say uh, our learnings are, you have to get the culture right. So the culture of continuous learning, of continuous innovation, of rethinking, of thinking outside the box, it's an important thing to get right. And that's, an e that's not an easy thing to change. So the continuously working on that and driving cultural change is an important part. I think you need a backbone and an infrastructure, an ability to actually have this cohesive sort of connective fabric that allows us to sort of have the backbone upon which to innovate. That becomes really important. And then I cannot overemphasize the word that we use a lot, bilingual. Since you have to bring convergence of disciplines. You have to bring people that can combine different things and come up with that converged sort of uh, innovation that comes from different disciplines. And so if you focus on those three things, they're probably our biggest learnings and probably our, uh, my number one advice. Sanjay Srivastava, thank you so much. Indeed, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.